Hello boys and girls. In my video Sportster vs Speedmaster, I felt it wound up with a bit of a negative slant. This is because, unsurprisingly I suppose, I wound up with the conclusion that the Sportster gave me the biggest smile. And this led people to suspect that I'd bought the wrong bike. I had lots of comments to say, the Speedmaster's not the one. You should have kept the Sportster. Well, that's understandable. But today, I'm going to start with a negative slant and then end positively. Hopefully that'll explain a bit better and more accurately how I feel about my Speedmaster. Now as I said in the Sportster vs Speedmaster video, I'd had my Sportster sort of four years, I'd done maybe 40,000 miles all but, I'd had the time and I'd spent some money and the aim was that it would give me the biggest smile when I was riding it. And it did and I was chuffed to bits with it. Indeed, as I said, I was sad to sell it. And the Speedmaster, by comparison, at that point, I'd had it uh, maybe two weeks, and oh, well, I'd had no time or money to spend on it. So, really, it couldn't put the biggest smile on my face. That's, that's just reality. But now, I've had the bike, what, two months? I have had a bit of time, I have spent the money, and not to mention blood, sweat and tears. And the result is, well, the Speedmaster, it's still not perfect. Some things are not done, and others, well, they're not as good as I'd hoped. But it is now a much better motorcycle. So some of the things that didn't get done, like the engine cases. Um, I did do the sprocket cover, or I had the sprocket cover powder coated and inspection cap. But I'm no mechanic, and that meant the engine cases on the right, which is the alternator cover, I just, I didn't want to get that off. It's got the magnets in it, the whole alternator state of business. And when I got the Triumph technical manual, it said that the magnets are very strong and that they're always pulling on the stator. So it's very difficult to get the alternator cover off the engine. Um, back in the old days, the magnets and the stator and everything it would be nailed directly to the engine itself coming off the crank. But nowadays, to save uh, production costs, actually the magnets are on the casing themselves. This means... If you're pulling the casing off, you're pulling against the magnets. You've got to try and pull the case off without scratching it and without getting your fingers ripped off. And I, I didn't want to do that on my own. On the other side, you've got the clutch case. And there you've got the clutch lever and the selector and the little arm. And inside is a selector rod and a, a gap to fit it in. But, of course, if you can't see it, you can't line it up and you can get cogs falling off and stuff like this. I didn't want to do that. I'm no mechanic. That's not my malarkey, so it's not done, so I'll have to live with that. Some of the things that are not as good as I'd hoped are like the welding on the backrest. It wasn't dressed properly, so it's a bit rough. There's a bit of spatter, uh, a couple of lumps and so on. Again, not the end of the world, but it's there and I'm aware of it. Uh, one thing that certainly isn't as I'd hoped, um, I noticed last year actually on the Sportster I started getting a pain in my shoulder. It's just an age thing, nothing much you can do about it, but it's there. I've noticed I get the same sort of pain when I'm driving as well. The um, solution is to bring the handlebars closer to me, which I've done. I've got risers. I've also moved the backrest slightly further forward, which pushes my whole body forward again. That reduces that stretching of the arms onto the handlebars, which is good. Um, one slightly negative thing is pushing my body forward actually reduces the distance to the foot controls. It's not a huge thing, but it means the angle of the foot brake is a bit steeper than I want. It's a bit higher than I want. Obviously, I could move the foot brake down a little bit to reduce that angle. The foot brake is actually very close to the crash bars and it's ever so easy to put your foot on the crash bar instead of the foot brake accidentally. I'll have to leave the foot brake slightly higher than I want. I can get used to that. That's that's manageable, certainly. Um, other things that aren't quite as I'd hoped is that there's some... With the brass I've got on the fuel cap and so on, it's lost its um, goldness, you know, in one day. And it's not weather or what have you, or dirt, it's it's UV light. It's not too bad and I can live with it, it's it's sort of darkened it. But it's it's not as I'd hoped, I suppose. And I've had to touch in some powder coating here and there. Which it had to be done, so that's definitely not as I'd hoped. Other things like there's no IMU, no inertial measurement unit, so no cornering ABS and such. But I knew that before I bought the bike, so I can live with that. One thing I absolutely hadn't anticipated was how hot the engine got. Now bearing in mind, I'm comparing this directly to a Sportster. 
sports store, which is ancient technology, air-cooled, and the Triumph Bonneville, which is very new technology, lovely new design and everything, and liquid-cooled. And yet, the Triumph Bonneville engine gets hotter than our sports store air-cooled engine. Get that. I would never have believed it, and if anybody had said to me, I would have said, you're talking rubbish. But I can tell you, it is not. It is true. And if, if you wanted to buy yourself a new or a late model Speedmaster, and you wanted to get dealer support and so on, so you wanted to buy it at a dealer's, if you're patient and if you wait around a little bit, you can get, say, a 2021 Speedmaster with a few hundred quid knocked off. The engine gets so hot, it's easy to melt your boots or your waterproofs or whatever, particularly on the alternator cover. Now, I've seen a couple like this. One in Edinburgh, where I bought my bike. Another one in Exeter, where I get all the work done. Realistically, get a new engine case. That costs money, so it means if you wanted to buy a late model Beamaster, you could save yourself a few quid. And it happens a lot, because the engine gets so unbelievably hot. But again, it's not the end of the world. And some of the things, well, I can do them later, like the powder coating, that can be done more or less at any point. Um, and other things, like the no IMU, there's no cooling ABS and such, I knew that before, so, you know, I can obviously put up with that. Um, and then the thing with the ouchy shoulder, if it gets worse, I could possibly put high bars on. Um, I don't want to do that, because I like the beach bars, but, you know, it's an option. If I needed to do it, I could. Now, Redang Revival here on YouTube, he's bought himself a Speedmaster or a year or so ago, and he asked a question in a recent video, it's, is the Speedmaster the world's best cruiser? He came to the conclusion that it wasn't because, for instance, a Harley-Davidson Glide is more comfortable, which, you know, is fair enough, it probably should be. But really, it's an unfair comparison. He was comparing the Speedmaster to a Street Glide or the BMW R18 that he's particularly fond of for whatever reason. But this, like the Street Glide, that starts at about 25 grand here in Britain, whereas a Speedmaster starts at about 12 and a half grand, literally the street glide is twice the price. It's not fair to compare the two. If you're spending twice as much, you expect the bike to be twice as good. So to say best or not, it's too subjective anyway, but it doesn't really work very well as a comparison. In my video, Sports vs. Speedmaster, Robert Matatich made the note that Harley Davidson's are, quote, notorious kit bikes. Well, which is true. The, the customization options for Harley-Davidson are infinite. And as I said to Robert, effectively, all bikes are kit bikes. Because when you buy a motorbike, you think, I'll have this, and I'll change that, and I'll do that. And you make alterations. You're not buying, as it were, the finished product. You are, in effect, buying a kit bike. What you're buying is something that's a good foundation, something you really love, something you've perhaps researched, you know is what you want, it ticks the boxes, it's the right starting point, and from there, you will aim to release its full potential. That's, to me, that's what riding a bike is all about, as opposed to, say, buying a car, you just buy it, and it's done. Whereas a bike, you're just buying a foundation. But you aim to release its full potential, that's what it's all about. Now, for me, on this particular bike, the Triumph Speedmaster, it all began on the 27th of June this year. That was delivery day. Now, today, which I'm riding this on the 29th of August, so almost exactly two months later, I've done 2,200 miles on it. 2,200 miles, but I've had a lot of time to think about it. But I did want to move quickly, because I'm riding this at the end of the summer in 2022, and we all know there's a recession coming, coming, and I don't know how things are going to turn out, so I need to get this stuff sorted out quickly. In the comments section, Nigel Maguire asked to know whether the upgrades had worked. Well, the upgrades were, firstly, the Ella Speed forward controls, the footrests and the brake and the gear lever. Uh, they cost £630. Now, Ella Speed are an Australian company. They sell this uh, extended forward controls kit for 800 Australian dollars. But with imports and taxes and carriage and so on, I ended up spending £630, which a couple of months ago was about 1200 Australian dollars. 
Uh, it's a bit less now because the exchange rate goes all over the place. But at the time, it was about 1200 Australian dollars. That's what I ended up paying, £630. And as I said, the um, difference between Harley-Davidson and Triumph in terms of customization is, is very difficult. The uh, options, particularly for a Harley Sportster, are literally infinite. There are so many different ways you can go to achieve the same thing. But on a Triumph, not like that. And for forward controls, in fact, the options aren't just few, there are two. I only found two in the whole world. Highway Hawk, who offer the Motorrad Burchard um, forward controls, which are €1,500, which is absolutely disgusting. Not very substantial either, so I wasn't impressed, but at €1,500, it doesn't matter. They're way too expensive to consider. So that was one option. The only other option was the Ella Speed. Now that they're fitted, I think they've moved the footrests about two centimetres higher, a little bit, three quarters of an inch, not much. I don't notice the raising height, and I certainly didn't want any raising height. I wanted them as low as possible. But what I really needed was to move them as far forward as was possible. And these, this Ella Speed forward control kit, you get about nine centimetres, nine and a half centimetres. So what's that? Three and a half inches, say, towards four inches. It's not um, massive, but it's enough. It makes a huge difference in terms of comfort. Much more what I was hoping for. I noticed when I first rode the Speedmaster on a test ride that it felt like there was nothing between my legs. And that was because it felt like my knees were so high. The uh, footrests were a bit too far towards me and pushing my legs up. And it felt very odd. Um, I mean, you get used to it and it's not a problem, but I didn't like that particular feeling. So getting further forward controls, you lower your legs, and you feel like you've got a motorcycle there. And that's, that's what I wanted. It's much more, for me, it's much more comfortable. So I'm very pleased with that. They've, um, they've done the job, the Ella Speed extended forward controls. They're also very solid. Nigel, if you're asking if the upgrades worked, the forward controls, certainly. I am very pleased with them, worth every penny. The second upgrade is the Triumph Roadster Screen. Interestingly, it's not the long haul screen, which is what I ordered. Um, £430 with delivery. The difference between the long haul screen and the roadster screen, as far as I can tell, is only the horizontal bar is chrome on the long haul and black on the roadster. In fact, the roadster black bar, I'm pleased with that because I've got more black on my bike, so it fits in well. So although I ordered the long haul, I got the roadster perfectly happy. That's, that's fine. I wouldn't say I'm perfectly happy with it really actually because it's very wobbly. It's not that it moves or what have you, the fittings themselves are very strong, but the Perspex or the PVC, whatever it is, it's too thin. It flaps about, actually it flaps about alarmingly. It's very distracting, particularly when you first ride. I was stunned, to be honest, absolutely stunned. And it does take your attention away from the actual riding, but you do get used to it, so it's not a huge problem. But it's not a problem you would even think of. If you were riding your Harley, for instance, and you bought a Memphis Shade screen or, or even a standard Harley screen, that would never happen. So Harley screens rock solid. The Triumph screen, the plastic, is feeble. Um, it's also too high. I think it's 18 inches. I could do with 15 or even 14 inches. The budget's spent now, so I'll have to live with it. And that's fine. I need a screen for the winter. This will do the job. But it's not as good by a long shot. It's not as good as a Harley screen. The fixings themselves are very chunky, very solid. I'm very pleased with that. Original fixing is ridiculous. You've got to take the top yoke off to get the brackets over the forks. Absolutely appalling situation. That's, that's very poor. But once it's on, the fixings, the brackets themselves clamp around the forks. And that's fine. They just sit there. In the summer, you don't want a screen. And in the winter, you definitely do. And it's only two bolts either side to remove. It's quick and easy, and that's much better than I thought it would be. It's it's not um, quick release by any means, but it's as near as you can get to quick release without being quick release. So as to whether that upgrade works, yes, it does, with all its faults. Nevertheless, it works, does the job. The third upgrade was the bar risers. I got Rox 4-inch pivoting risers. That's about 100 millimeters. I got the Motone 1-inch up and over risers. Uh, and that had to be co uh, coupled with the Triumph High Bar Cable Kit. Altogether, £330. 
if you're moving the bars by five inches the cables just aren't long enough you need to get the cable kit so you know that adds another hundred odd pounds to the you've got to do it if if you want to move the bars and i did so i had to do it and i did altogether 330 pounds and it really helps that said it's actually still not enough five inches towards me is good and it really helps much more comfortable but actually i could do with six inches of pullback maybe six and a half and you do need one inch of rise i didn't want any comfort wise but if you don't have the rise the handlebars foul on the petrol cap if i did want to commit to six or six and a half inch rises i'd have to get them custom made and that's a whole different ball game very much more expensive it also has the huge advantage that I can keep the beach bars. And the beach bars are wonderful. They look right on the bike. That whole laid down sleek look, it's just wonderful. I much prefer the beach bars to any other bars, but particularly high bars. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. As I say, the petrol cap. Now I've got the Monza cap, which flips up on a hinge. That gets in the way of the bars. I have to turn the steering full left, pop the uh, petrol cap up which actually makes filling up a nuisance because the left mirror digs in your belly when you're filling up the petrol. But again, that's only a minor thing. I can easily live with that because it enables me to have a much more comfortable ride. The next update was the Russell Cycle Products Daylong Touring Saddle and Backrest. A splendid £975, so the most expensive single upgrade I did. The uh, Daylong Touring Saddle is very wide and... I had no idea that would make so much difference, but it really, really does. If you have a wide seat, it gives you more support, it's more comfortable, much less bum ache, and it just feels snugger. It's it's wonderful. Also, the material is good. They they offer you leather or vinyl or something called Sumbrella. Uh, I did go for Sumbrella because they said it breathes, where vinyl obviously doesn't, and leather much less so. So I went for the Sumbrella, and it feels lovely. It's just excellent I'm, I'm pleased i did i i wondered about leather but i went with this umbrella which comes in a variety of colors again 975 pounds masses of money but well worth it backrest also similarly wonderful because it's wide it gives you masses of support it really is good there's a huge amount of vertical adjustability it's incredible really really good the only thing i didn't like about it and don't like about it is that the backrest assembly itself is is very cumbersome um, i asked if they could put the backrest on the mudguard finisher and they said no there's no room which is you know fair enough but i had it welded on to the mudguard finisher and that works well if you use the standard system which um they put the backrest onto the passenger pad base it winds up being a huge huge plate just sat on the back mudguard they cover it with foam and leather to to make it a passenger pad but it would be murderously uncomfortable for a passenger i had it all taken apart and uh, welded to the mudguard finisher and then powder coated sorted out it looks sleek it works well uh, much lighter much lower much better i've also had the backrest moved closer to the seat my body is slightly further forward which helps with the arm reach uh, 975 pounds it may not be worth it for you if you wanted to go a cheaper route, I wonder if Russell Cycle Products would supply just the backrest, and then you could weld it to the mudguard finisher yourself and use the standard Triumph comfort seat. I think for most people that would probably work well, and it'd be a fraction of the price. So, Nigel, did that upgrade work? Well, yes, definitely. It cost a lot, but I'm very pleased with it. Well worth it. Uh, the next upgrade that I did was the Triumph Teardrop Black Mirrors. I only paid £54 for these from eBay, which is about half price, so that's a no-brainer. They're a better shape, I think, and certainly black. Uh, they're much lower than the standard round mirrors. I think the round mirrors, they look a bit mousy alike. Didn't really like those so much. They worked okay. They didn't vibrate. That was marvellous. But the teardrop shape is a much better shape than round because that extra little edge, if you like, it, it lets you see, particularly on the motorway, it lets you see more width of road and you can see cars coming. You don't get that so much with the round mirrors. So for the sake of £54, I was really pleased with that. These upgrades in particular work really, really well <laughs> and they're really easy to fit. So that's definitely a plus. 
And the next update was the Motone Brassware. I went for the Monza Brass Petrol Cap, the Top Yoke Nut and the Fork Nuts. Altogether cost me £285. Loads of money, but they do look great. The uh, brass against the black really does set it off. It's nice. The petrol cap, which flips open backwards, I think more usually they open forwards, but um, because of the handlebars, I flip it open backwards. The next update was the Scott Oiler V system, which is a chain oiler, and with fitting that cost £230. But when I looked in the manual, it said oil the chain every 200 miles. I could not believe it. Every 200 miles you're supposed to oil the chain. That's what, two or three times a day on decent ride? That's not going to happen. That is never going to happen. It's, it's outrageous. This is the 21st century. A chain is Victorian technology. What's it doing on a modern bike? There should be a belt. A belt is durable. It'll last forever. No maintenance. It's very light. Virtually silent. There's no reason modern manufacturers shouldn't put a belt on, but they don't. Most bikes are chains. I asked my brother Mike and he said he didn't like Scott oilers because they were messy. And he's dead right. They do spray oil everywhere and the oil goes really dark and really hard. And it's ever so difficult to get off, particularly the back wheel. But uh, nevertheless, as I said, I'm not oiling flipping chain every 200 miles. So I have to get a, school, uh, a Scott oiler. So in terms of whether or not the update works, well, yes, it does. But it's an evil necessity now the last update that I did was the powder coating and getting the Triumph black finishers like the uh, mudguard finisher and so on. Altogether, that was all £320. But when you go to these places, there's never any admin and it makes it so difficult as a customer to get it done properly and in a timely fashion. But the powder coating I got done was the uh, bar ends. The intake covers over what used to be the air filters, the throttle position covers over what used to be the carburetors, the sprocket cover and the cap, which was part of the engine case and I could get off easily, so it did get done and it looks really good. I'm pleased, very pleased with that. I've got obviously the handlebars and the risers done and the top yoke. The object of the exercise here was to get everything weatherproof because if you leave chrome on in British weather, it tarnishes. Unless you want to spend all your life polishing the bike, I don't want to spend all my life polishing the bike. This is not my granny's mantelpiece. This is a motorbike. It's designed to be ridden, not polished. So you've got to protect your bike as best you can, and, and I have as much as I can. Interestingly, the Triumph black finishers are painted. They're not powder coated. So on the mudguard finisher, that needed to be powder coated because, you know, you might be putting stuff on it, a bag or anything. Yes, Nigel, if, if you're wondering if that particular upgrade worked, yes, it does. It's a real pain to get powder coating done, but it's worth it, and I'm glad I did. So talking of worth it, what was the final cost? Well, I spent 15,900 of the finest British pounds. The bike itself cost 12,500 pounds, uh, had one or two extras like heated grips in with it. Um, I, th I, I regard it as a good investment, I suppose. So we're left with the same final question as I asked in the uh, Sportster video. Am I smiling? Has the Speedmaster put on that big smile that the Sportster used to? Well, I can tell you the first smile came when I was in Barnstable. I was coming out onto the A361. It was a lovely day. Triumph specified 600 miles for running the bike in, and I'd done, I think, about 520 at that point. And I thought, you know, I've had enough. I am sick to death of running it in. I've never run in a vehicle before. Twelve and a half grand, I want to look after it, so I want to run it in properly. And this was before I'd had all the enhancements done. But I hadn't realised how cheesed off I'd become with the running in process. It spoils the ride because you're looking at revs, you're making sure you're not sticking to the same engine speed all the time. But after 520 miles, a couple of weeks of that, I tell you, I was sick to death. So I got onto the A361, and you know, it's a good road, and I thought, well, I can crank it up to 60 and just put on the cruise control, and I did, and it was wonderful. 
And that was when the first smile came and I realised what was hindering that first smile wasn't actually the lack of the enhancements. It was the running in. That is, It's just boring and it's frustrating. That was the first time that big sports-esque smile hit me and I was so pleased. The second smile happened when I was on what I call the Birmingham Oxford Bridgewater Loop. It's about 400 miles and the first time I did this on the Speedmaster was after I'd had the enhancements done and that was a fantastic ride. It was a lovely day. I was just sat in the saddle cruising down the motorway. Absolutely wonderful. Just loving it and I realised at that point this is what I could do all day long. It is just completely wonderful the smile on my face was as broad as it can be and i was chuffed to bits it was more comfortable than the sports to buy quite a lot actually and i was i was so so pleased with that that was the second smile and the third smile uh, well not actually chronologically but uh, for the for the sake of our list the third smile was in fact when i first saw the bike when it rolled off the van and i thought what a handsome bike and it really is. It's black and white, which is sort of old school Bonneville, uh, although nowadays it's fusion white and sapphire black. But these little tweaks and hints, they, they give the colour some depth and it makes it, as it were, a little bit more dynamic. Uh, sounds a bit pretentious, doesn't it? But nevertheless, it is just, oh, wonderful. It looks so, so handsome. And that's uh, away from the bike looking at it. And it's, oh, wonderful but when you're sat on the bike particularly now i've had the powder coating done with the brass and everything oh it looks so so handsome and that's just the looks but i've said you know many times actually that triumph should get an award for the sound of the bike because it sounds handsome too and bearing in mind this is a euro 5 bike it's uh, got to meet all the california emissions regulations and triumph will work to get this even with a catalytic converter it sounds absolutely glorious. It sounds just like a motorbike should. Absolutely wonderful. And another thing that Triumph should get an award for is how much motorcycle they have squeezed into this tiny space. 40 years ago, I had a Z650, which I loved. And this bike, this Speedmaster, is only two inches, two and a half inches longer, say 60 millimeters or something, than a Z650. But it is literally twice as much motorcycle. It is incredible that Triumph have got all of that bike into such a small space, and it's lower. It's an incredible design feat. Triumph should get awards for that. So at the end of the day, we've got to say, the smile on my face on my Speedmaster is complete. Effectively, the full potential has been released. The initial requirement to buy a good bike, the best possible foundation, and to release that full potential has been achieved. It is wonderful. The smile, it is like the smile I had on a Sportster. So I wind up with a Sportster-like smile, but it's better and it lasts longer. Cheerio.